From the Internet Law and Policy Foundry, this is the Tech Policy Grind podcast. Every two weeks, we'll discuss recent developments and exciting topics in the technology and internet law and policy space. I'm Rima Musa, and I'm a member of the fourth cohort of Foundry Fellows. The Foundry is a collaborative organization for internet law and policy professionals who are passionate about disruptive innovation. In today's episode, Foundry Fellow Lama Muhammad sat down with Nick Merrill, Research Fellow at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity and Director of the Daylight Security Research Lab, to discuss the fragility of internet governance, the importance of decentralizing and creating a more inclusive internet, and what governments, the private sector, and other organizations can do to strengthen the internet, especially in times of conflict. As a research fellow at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity, Nick directs the Daylight Security Research Lab, which aims to shift the way people understand, identify, and implement safeguards against harm. His academic training spans computer security, human-computer interaction, and design research. You can access all of Nick's research publications on his Google Scholar profile, and he regularly posts to his Substack blog. Lemma is a member of the fourth class of ILPF Fellows. She currently works as an associate at the Glenn Echo Group in Washington, D.C., a communications and public relations firm specializing in tech policy. At the Glenn Echo Group, Lemma works on policy and communications within artificial intelligence, augmented and virtual reality, cybersecurity, the digital divide, and privacy. Hi, Nick. Thank you so much for joining this week's episode of the Tech Policy Grind podcast. We are excited to have you on the show to discuss the fragility of the internet, especially in times of conflict. So, Nick, let's dive right in, starting pretty broadly. Um, Do you mind explaining to the audience what exactly is internet fragility and what it is about the internet's infrastructure that causes it to be so fragile? Sure, and uh, thanks for having me on. Uh, Internet fragility is a little tricky to define, but roughly it's the notion that the internet could become unreliable or completely unavailable to a large population of internet users. And that can be either regionally or globally. So at the regional level, we might see the internet go off due to, let's say, a natural disaster. We saw that happen uh, uh, earlier this year, I believe, in Tonga after their volcanic eruption. Uh, It also may uh, make it easier for a government to shut down internet access. We see this in India, unfortunately, far too frequently whenever there's civil unrest. Um, So internet fragility can take both of those forms on the regional level. Then on the global level, uh, internet fragility could mean that the internet, or at least important parts of the internet, are off. People all over the world can't access them. Uh, That can be localized to certain websites, like when Facebook was down for everyone. uh, I think that was October. Uh, Or it could be more widespread, like attacks on really, really basic internet infrastructures, which would be an extremely catastrophic internet-wide outage. And and that's the stuff that really keeps keeps one up at night. Of course, those are black swan events, low probability and high impact. But internet fragility really runs the gamut from the very local to the very global. Right. Thank you so much for that explanation. Um, and you brought up Facebook. So and that was that happened pretty recently. And I think even earlier, I think Amazon AWS was also down. And so we've seen time and time again, the results of a fragile Internet. And I think you've written a lot of op eds about how major sites like Amazon and Facebook when they go into blackout. So what is the reason for these outages? And what are the broader consequences to society and the global internet by these outages? Yeah, there's no one reason for these outages. Facebook's outage was caused by misconfiguration in one of the internet's core protocols. Uh, That protocol, BGP, or Border Gateway Protocol, is famously bad. And we could probably spend the rest of this podcast talking just about BGP. And the Amazon outage you're probably referring to was the result actually of an outage in a content distribution network, or CDN. Uh, 
which is basically a provider that sits between you and the service. Uh, and again, we could probably spend the rest of this podcast talking just about CDNs. So the only really succinct answer to the question, how do these happen, is that the internet is really complex. There are lots of interdependencies, and these interdependencies can cause cascading failures, where an outage in one service causes an outage in another, causes an outage in another. And it's that dynamic of, of that cascade being unpredictable that we're really concerned about when we think about internet fragility. Right. Thank you so much. Um, and when these outages happen, such as when there's an issue with the broader internet protocol and CDNs, why it seems that there tends to be power that's concentrated within the internet. Like there are only a few people who m manage these powers. What are the broader implications for that? And how can we kind of create the internet to be a little more decentralized if it makes it equitable in any sense? Yeah. So it's certainly the case that there is centralized power in the internet. And uh, David Clark called these famously control points. They're the, these points of, of control kind of over uh, uh, how the internet operates and, and what the internet is. So the question of how we decentralize it is a very hot one right now. And when we think about, you know, uh, Web3 and kind of blockchain, I hesitate to say revolution, but uh, the development in that sector has to do with a few things. First, it, you know, I think looks at financial services as centralized. And indeed, you know, there are only a few operators of the global financial system. And we can look at the global financial system that is as something that is potentially fragile, similarly to the way that the Internet is potentially fragile. Um, and, you know, I think that although... Uh, blockchains are perhaps seen as a financial technology. They are, in fact, deeply a web technology. And it was only later, ironically enough, that these technologies started to be, you know, kind of uh, uh, people thought about how to apply them to internet infrastructure. So now we're starting to see projects that attempt to do things like decentralized naming and other kinds of core uh, internet infrastructure services. I expect that trend to continue we'll probably see more attempts to do things like uh, uh, content distribution networks or, you know, even basic internet routing. Uh, I mentioned BGP earlier. BGP is one thing where I think modern consensus protocols could, could really make a big difference in, you know, producing authenticated routes and so on. Um, you know, that said, I don't know that any of these will really become widespread in practice unless uh, you can convince people to use them. And that, could take a lot of forms. One, of course, is, you know, kind of uh, uh, grassroots organizing, which is more or less how blockchain is spread. And another is um, what you might call uh, a top down, convincing a big company like Cloudflare, Amazon to get into the blockchain business, right? But ultimately, this is a story of institutions. And what we have now are, you know, kind of these institutions that are uh, really have centralized a lot of power over how the internet works and how it's provisioned. Now, what this means, is this good or bad? It really depends who you are and what you want the internet to be and what you want the internet to become. Um, and you know, I'm sure we'll talk a lot more about that as we chat, but whether any of these things are good or bad, whether even the centralization of the internet is good or bad, it depends who you are and what you want. Thank you, that's really eye-opening. And, and you were talking a little bit about the different projects that grassroots organizations have done. You are the director of the Daylight Security Research Lab at the UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity. Tell us a little bit about your work and how are you and your team working to make the internet a little bit stronger? Yeah, you know, what I tell people lately is that we ask some tough questions and give data-driven responses to them. And we don't tow any particular party line. We have no preconceived notion of how the internet should be. Uh, that's kind of what makes us unique. We take measurements from the internet measurement community and we refract them through this broader social lens to think about three main themes. The first theme is stability. What attacks threaten to disrupt internet service globally? Uh, the second is power. Where are the internet's key points of global control? And the third is equity. Who controls those points of global control? And who decides who controls those points of global control? So all of these questions are descriptive. And I think once we get to the equity question, it, it begs these normative questions, who should decide, who should control them? But we are trying to create a descriptive account of where power lies on the internet 
and that descriptive account helps us understand how social and political power operates in the internet. That sounds really cool. And kind of based off of your last explanation, there are a lot of international entities and consequences kind of involved because obviously the internet is no longer owned by the United States, but we kind of see Russia and China kind of steering away from the original status quo of how the centralized internet operates. Can you kind of talk to us a little bit more about Russia and China's version of the internet and how that might affect global citizens' use and access to the internet? Sure. You know, Russia and China and also the European Union are all navigating this internet that, as you say, was effectively set up by the United States. It was set up by the U.S. military in the 20th century. And its goal when the U.S. set up this internet before it had any commercial use was, uh, you know, to, to achieve military outcomes and to project military power. It became an economic tool later. It became a commercial tool later. And it became a, a tool of U.S. soft power later. And But still, we see today, this internet is effectively provisioned by the United States, at least in the sense that its core infrastructure is run by U.S.-based corporations. Now, of course, those corporations have a, let's say, complex relationship with the U.S. federal government. Facebook and the U.S. federal government do not necessarily get along. It is still the case, however, that this is an American internet. And we have seen in the history of the U.S., and you know, I think that this is somehow by design in the U.S., uh, there is this conflict between private enterprise and the U.S. government. That's how the mm -hmm. U.S. operates. This is an, a very intrinsically American internet. Mm -hmm. So that's the status quo. Now, is this internet uncensored and decentralized? Sure, it's decentralized among U.S. corporations, but this is not a perfect status quo. And even Americans are unhappy with corporate control over information flows. And that's on all sides of the U.S. political spectrum that we see that dissatisfaction. Now, once you leave the United States, the shape and the nature of that dissatisfaction is even more complex and even more multipolar. So, yeah, you know, this Internet is, quote unquote, free, but it's also massively hegemonic. Mm. So when I think about Russia and China, I think about how they navigate this complex strategic environment, wanting to maintain the benefits of a global communications network, but also wanting to exert control that's beneficial to their strategic aims. And when framed like that, you know, this is not so different from what the European Union does, right? This right. is not so different from what Facebook or Google does. Now, we don't know exactly how this was going to affect citizens' use of the internet, either domestically or globally. But once we view these questions as a global power struggle for control over the internet and not just control via the internet, I think that the struggle and its complexities become a lot more apparent and a lot more interesting to talk about also. Often, you know, the struggle is reduced down to the free versus the closed internet. And our earliest research kind of poked holes in this dichotomy. The internet is vastly, vastly multipolar. And, you know, my takeaway from all of this is that the internet is a domain of conflict. Mm -hmm. It's a domain of strategic competition and cooperation. And states and non-states are competing and cooperating for power over, over the material conditions of this internet itself. So when we look at those material conditions as they exist today, my question is, you know, will this status quo of U.S. hegemony remain? Right. And if not, what internet comes next? Mm -hmm. What does the internet look like during hegemonic decline? This is the million dollar question that I think no one really knows the answer to. That's super interesting. And I would also say, going back to your earlier point about how the American public kind of reacts and feels to the way that the internet works, we are now seeing a rise in public interest in privacy content moderation, uh, children's safety. What does that look like in the future of the internet? In a more decentralized internet, does that pose risk for cyber attacks? Or is privacy at a risk? What are some of those intersectional issues that people care about in the future of the internet? That's a great question. You know, I think we've certainly seen a growing interest in how the internet operates and who the internet fails for. And, uh, you know, I, I think that probably uh, 
while certainly privacy has been nothing new on the internet, nor has child safety been anything new on the internet, these were some of the earliest moral panics in the earliest days of the internet were about child pornography. And what we've seen, uh, I think, lately is perhaps a rise in moderation specifically as a point of interest. And there's this unstable boundary between, you know, moderation and censorship. Moderation is not the same thing as censorship, of course. Uh, and because there are moderators, it does not mean that there's some bureau of truth. At the same time, you know, these are tricky issues. Um, no one, and I think it would be naive to say that anyone is going to find a solution to moderation, but how we navigate the problem is going to decide, in, I think in, in you know, no uncertain terms, what this internet looks and feels like in the coming uh, uh, days. Will it remain and to what extent will it remain in the hands of private companies to deal with these issues? It has never, or certainly since SESTA-FOSTA, is not, even in the United States, fully in the hands of platforms to decide what moderation looks like. Now, will that border move more toward government participation or further away from government participation? Or will it remain the same where the battle just goes back and forth, right? In right. the court of public opinion. Probably the answer will depend where you are and what kind of jurisdiction you're in. And we'll see different jurisdictions handle this differently. But it's a really, really interesting issue that I think is going to play out dynamically over the next you know, five to 10 years. And alongside it, and very much intertwined with it, is this interest in blockchain and Web3. Will these, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, projects find alternative models of moderation? Will they be the newly unmoderatable, uh, you know, kind of form of, of communication? My guess is probably somewhere in between, right? They're going to be imperfectly moderated, just like uh, Web 1 and Web 2 were imperfectly moderated. Mm -hmm. And we may see, you know, these uh, Internet technologies go through uh, kind of different forms and different models of moderation. One thing that interests me about Web 3 in particular is that at least in kind of its most trivial formulation, where there's this publicly available blockchain, uh, there actually are potentially some moderation affordances there, contrary to kind of popular imagination. Now, will designers actually take advantage of them? Or is it kind of ideologically the case that Web3 developers are resistant to any form of moderation? That's a drama that has yet to play out, right? And I think what we saw in the early web is that early engineers and designers said, wow, this is going to be a platform for free speech, free speech. And, you know, and then we got 4chan and 8chan, right? Right. So these things always play out in surprising ways. But I think that the texture of how it plays out is going to be incredibly interesting to observe. And again, these go back to this kind of uh, uh, questions I, I referenced earlier about power, you know, who controls the uh, these control points and who decides who controls these control points. Moderation is basically a, a question about those two questions. Yeah, I completely agree. And especially on the concept of power. I mean, everybody has been reading in the news recently about Elon Musk's new saga about purchasing Twitter and his whole idea about the future of content moderation. Obviously, Twitter is, a, is an important platform to many people for how they access and digest information. And in terms of kind of who is controlling the internet, he is becoming one of those entity bodies. And so how are we making sure that the future of a decentralized internet and a more equitable internet is still bringing, you know, communities of color to the conversation, people who don't have access to the internet? How are we bringing, you know, queer and binary folk to these conversations? People who are controlling and are the faces of the internet still tend to be the same heteronormative, cis, upper class, upper class white male? How are we kind of changing the narrative about making the internet more, more equal in, in any sense, if it's meant to be free? I think that's a fantastic question. And, you know, when we think about Web3, for all of its claims of disruption, the people who we see doing it seem to look very similar to the people who were doing the disruption of yesteryear for Web2. Listen, I, I was inspired, my friend Jake, who is actually full-time kind of Web3 entrepreneur, exposed me to this Buckminster Fuller quote, which has stuck in my brain forever, which is that the best thing to do is create new institutions to replace the old ones. Don't bother mm -hmm. fighting the old institutions. Mm -hmm. And when I think about something like Twitter, when I think, you know, our job is to create, I think, better institutions. And one of them that really comes to mind for me, there's this great project called NYC Mesh. And it's this mesh network, it's in the kind of the New York metro area that builds this community run internet service provider. And when I think about internet fragility, I, I do think about mesh networks quite a bit at the local level. 
because even if the global and if there were some horrible outage, NYC Mesh, at least locally, would provide this kind of service. And the way they do it is brilliant. It's through grassroots organizing. Mm -hmm. They get, you know, people, especially from disadvantaged communities who, and this is probably a little bit of a tangential topic, but often uh, people who kind of come from disadvantaged backgrounds will uh, have really interesting barriers to getting high quality internet service. Either they're being price gouged by telecom monopolies or those telecom monopolies have no incentive to provide reasonable service in their areas. And this is the case in New York City, unfortunately, even though it's a huge metropolitan area, we still see this dynamic. So NYC Mesh came in to fill that gap. And of course, you know, the people to engage with are the people who, you know, suffer the most from this uh, market dynamic. And they produced what I perceive as a successful kind of model of uh, grassroots organizing around a communications network. Now, their communications network interoperates perfectly with our global internet. But, you know, in theory, uh, this kind of grassroots organizing can happen over any kind of communications network. And creating institutions like that, looking at that model and saying, hey, we can do this. That, to me, is the most promising avenue there is. Uh, There's a great example called Guifi.net in Spain. That's basically this anarchist ISP Mm. where everyone who who, uh, contributes infrastructure, that infrastructure becomes part of the commons and creates, you know, expands Guifi's network. Um, And so looking at these two examples side by side, I think, well, you know, Twitter, you, you know, and Elon Musk's idea of what Twitter can and should be, Let's just build something else, hmm. you know, and, and what does it look like to build something else? And, and really, you know, I think uh, uh, starting organizing around that is is a really powerful idea, potentially. Mm-hmm. Uh, I'm always here for revolutionary takes and I'm a big fan of mesh networks. <laughs> so thank you for sharing. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, I think it's important that we discuss this because unfortunately, Ukraine is still bearing extremely devastating consequences of war. Uh, So do you mind talking to us a little bit about the dangers citizens face in this kind of correlated relationship between escalating international conflict and a fragile internet? Yeah, that's such a great topic. Listen, citizens of Ukraine face risks to their lives from war crimes. That has nothing to do with the internet. Now, can the internet play a role in it? Of course. And in fact, speaking of Elon Musk, he distributed these Starlink uh, 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 terminals to people. That's a great way to get a targeted attack from uh, an adversary because it's mm-hmm. easy enough to track the you know kind of uh, radio signatures and so on. Um, so, mm-hmm. so I would say that that that's a horrible idea that has nothing to do necessarily with uh, <laughs> with Russia, but maybe has something to do with the internet. But anyway, you know, there was a lot of speculation that this would be the first cyber war, and it really hasn't been yet. Mm-hmm. Now, will an increasingly unstable international order threaten internet stability? Yeah, okay, probably, or at least it'll cause the internet to decompose into kind of regional blocks within which, you know, interoperability is high and between which mm-hmm. interoperability is relatively lower, it's more partial, maybe more painful. And this is my, my postdoc advisor, Steve Weber's argument about global trade. And, and mm-hmm. I think it applies also to the internet, which I view as a system of global data trade. Mm-hmm. Now, how will that composition, that decomposition rather, affect people's lives or their life chances, their chances to live a different life from the one that they live? You know, the internet was imagined as a utility for people to improve their life chances, kind of to connect with people around the world and foster new connections. And this would, you know, increase their lot in life, uh, break down borders and so on uh, to capital flows, as I think is the implicit imagining in that. And there's been some doubt about that narrative for some time. It seems like, you know, this internet has really trapped us in a new kind of precarity uh, with increasing gig work and increasing contingency. So I'm skeptical that this decomposition will necessarily have any effect on that trend, at least in the industrialized West. That trend is really one of extractive labor logics. Outside, Mm -hmm. it's hard for me to say because I think the story is going to be so multifaceted. This is going to play out very differently in the Solomon Islands than it will in mainland China. Right. right? And those are two countries that have an uncertain relationship with one another right now Mm -hmm. and with the West. And certainly once I start thinking about, well, Solomon Islands versus Fiji, it's very hard for us to say what this decomposition could or will look like. And of course, there's a chance that this decomposition will reverse and that the internet will become more hegemonic, either in the hands of the U.S. corporations or in the hands of uh, Chinese corporations or the Chinese government. We don't know exactly what this will look like. 
interoperability could be higher or lower in the future than it is today. We just really don't know. And kind of expanding a little bit more, what is your biggest fear? Obviously, we haven't had a cyber war yet, knock on wood, but what do you think, What in your mind, what is the scariest thing that could possibly happen? The scariest thing that could possibly happen is ad hoc competition such that the internet becomes massively and unpredictably destabilized. The reason this is scary is that it will be hard to plan around in a way that assures that goods and money continue to flow. That, to me, is the nightmare scenario. So the reason why I'm so committed to this descriptive account, even though there are so many normative points to be made about how the internet should be, is that the clearer we can get on these descriptive accounts of how power operates, the better a chance we have at having a more rational competition. Um, and what we saw during, for example, nuclear conflict is that, well, this is an incredibly potentially destabilizing technology, and it would be very easy for us to say, well, this shouldn't exist. But instead, what you see is that it's in everyone's best interest, at least the best interest of you know states, to hoard these weapons and use them as a deterrent. Well, now we are in a really unstable situation, because if we don't know how this is going to escalate, we could end civilization. So what you see instead is the development of basically game theory and application of game theory and other kind of mathematical formulations to this deterrent problem and in such a way that creates you know, a more rational model of what that competition and conflict could look like. That's exactly what we don't have on the internet. If it, we were to start to see you know, escalation in cyber conflict, what could happen is that the internet just just down. It's just off, it's just broken for most people, for most cases. That would be a really a nightmare situation in which you know people are trying to go to an ATM and the ATM doesn't work, and then they have to smash the ATM, right? This is really, really a nightmare situation. I would rather see a kind of great power conflict some, some days, not all days. I'd rather see great power conflict than tiny ad hoc skirmishes. Now, all of that said, all of that said, I do think that there's a third path that involves grassroots organizing and local internets. And that to me has become kind of the most promising path forward. It's the best hedge we have. Because then at least if there's great power conflict, that global communications network may be degraded, but local networks and local communications can maintain at least some level of, uh, you know, they can degrade more gracefully. And I understand that that's not a dreamy situation. I'm not painting necessarily a Pollyannish vision of this beautiful internet, but I do think that it's uh, uh, least bad in, in uh, the case of conflict. Now, of course, I'd love to see no conflict at all. I do think that that's relatively unlikely. And the longer you look over the timeline, over the long history of this internet, probably going to last hundreds of years, potentially, if not thousands of years, this internet, um, yeah, eventually we're going to start to see some conflict. How do we manage it? And how do we keep it from being truly, truly painful? Those are kind of the big questions. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you mentioned competition and with our new head of the FTC, her big agenda is about competition and the goal of breaking up big tech. Do you think that has any kind of relationship with internet infrastructure? What will that do for internet infrastructure? And how does that play in into, into the future of the global use of the internet? Let me start by saying that I'm as allergic to huge monopolies uh, that extract profit as anyone else. That <laughs> said, I have yet to hear a really coherent explanation of how breaking up big tech is going mm -hmm. to improve outcomes in privacy or uh, security or internet stability or any other key indicator that we care about. If we have a thousand Twitters that are all equally toxic, I don't know if we're in a really a better situation except to say that there's com more competition among toxic platforms, right? Mm, yeah. So listen, competition certainly has its place. When I think about the internet, though, there are some things about it that absolutely should not be competitive or mm. certainly at the very least work best at scale. 
something like Google works well because it has a, a really good view of what people search for, and that allows it to find what you're looking for. The problem with Google isn't that it works at scale. It isn't even that it invades your privacy by looking at your search queries. It's that there's no popular control over how it should work, how it should hide results, how it should deal with your data. The problem is a lack of popular control over this basically, you know, uh, uh, centralized or, or at least, um, you know, um, how do I say, like uh, uh, in data vertical, let's say, this, this kind of panopticon. There's no mm -hmm. popular control over it. And when I think about something like Cloudflare, Cloudflare is incredibly important internet infrastructure. Is there competition in the market for, you know, CDNs? Yeah, there's, there's some competition in the market for CDNs. I'd argue Cloudflare is, is kind of, you know, probably the biggest one from the perspective, especially of small firms who may have nowhere else to go but Cloudflare. Right. And when I think about it, it's like, well, you know, maybe we're looking more at a public option. And this has been floated by some colleagues at Berkeley and, and beyond, public option for the core of the internet. Yeah, maybe what we're looking for is less about breaking up tech monopolies and more providing a public, you know, in, in analogy to healthcare, uh, something that's like a, a public option. Right. Right. Uh, something that the, the government runs. There's there's democratic checks over it. There are democratic processes to govern it. And uh, we can allow there to be competition outside. You'll have to compete with free. Mm -hmm. You know, this is how healthcare works in Canada. I'm in Canada right now. Right. Oh, okay. You're welcome <laughs> to run a, uh, for example, a, 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 a car insurance company. Right. But you'll have to compete with the province. Good luck. Mm -hmm. And again, this, you know, insurance is something maybe we don't think about as infrastructure. It's incredibly important infrastructure. Car insurance runs, kind of runs the economy in a way. If people are too afraid to drive or, you know, mm -hmm. they're just getting knocked out of the economy because of, of uh, you know, lawsuits and such from driving, it would be really difficult to do anything. So we have these private companies and there's good enough competition with them in the U.S., um, but there's a case for a public option in all of these sectors. And the internet is something where, well, we don't see robust competition. Maybe the entrance of a public option would make that competition more robust. That makes sense. And kind of on the topic of the role of government, and you mentioned the importance of grassroots organizations, what is the role of government, the private sector, nonprofits, or maybe a three-way public-private partnership play in strengthening the infrastructure of the internet, especially during times of conflict or kind of mitigating something and planning something before conflict occurs? Yeah, the question there is strengthening for whose benefit? Strengthening it against what? And what we've seen in the past is that a lot of things that supposedly strengthen the internet without specifying answers to those questions you know, results in some unpleasant outcomes. For example, okay, Tor was more or less developed by the US government to poke China's eye. And the ironic result is that China can basically block Tor. And most Chinese internet users don't seem to want to use Tor anyway. And now Tor runs the dark web and facilitates a tremendous amount of criminal activity. Right. right. So governments typically try at least to strengthen the Internet to project their power. It's the case with Tor. They mm -hmm. might make the Internet available in order to destabilize a regime. We've seen that the U.S. at least attempt to do that in Cuba. Mm -hmm. Or they may strengthen the Internet by selectively cutting their slice of the Internet off from the rest of the world's Internet, which is what we've seen in Russia and to some extent in China. Although I would say the extent of that cutting has been overplayed in both cases in different ways. Mm -hmm. the, the point here is that what strengthening means means looks very different depending on who you are. And this goes back to my point about the internet being a domain of conflict, of strategic competition and cooperation. Again, what excites me when I think about these strengthening is this grassroots uh, organizing that, that produces robust, if local, infrastructures that are, that are popularly controlled. Right. And based on a few of the examples you've given, it really does have a question of who has power and, and how do we said that they have power to do particular things. So what are your thoughts on even pushing this idea of control to intergovernmental bodies like the United Nations or ITU, the International Telecommunications Union, would that better or worsen how particular actions are carried out? I don't know, but I'm highly skeptical. What mm -hmm. popped into my head when you were asking that question was Greta Thunberg in front of the UN mm -hmm. telling them off because they didn't do anything. 
Mm. And I think when you were talking about the UN in particular, the latent hypothesis there is that the right, the right entities to sit at the table about how the internet works are states. Mm. And, you know, the UN has this kind of, you know, internet governance body uh, that takes delegates from all over the world. And of course, I don't think that that's a bad thing. Mm. Are nations and our nation states as we conceive of them really the right unit that we care about? Maybe, you know, maybe they are. Um, my guess, though, is that there has to be some other way of thinking about the internet. Mm. And when I think about the United States, and especially people who participate in that kind of UN governance, because I've gone to that that body when it was in Berlin a couple of years ago before COVID, mm. you know, they're they're very urban, wealthy people. Right. And they don't represent the interests of rural Americans. Right. And, you know, when I think about people from all of these other countries, I don't know what dynamics are being occluded by their participation in this body. So when I think about popular control over the internet, I don't know that nation states are really the thing that we want to look to as a prime example. Mm -hmm. And ITU and IETF and ICANN, although they have done a good job of stewarding the internet, more or less, I would say, they're not democratic institutions. And there's this great mm -hmm. paper on this, actually, that I can, I can follow up with about kind of how they are not meaningfully civic. I forget the author's name right now. Mm -hmm. so these are not meaningfully civic bodies. These are technocratic bodies, right? Mm -hmm. So there has to be some other model, I think, for what popular control can really look like, what democracy can really look like on the internet. And we haven't quite figured that out yet. I would say in a ideal or perfect world, we have the public sitting at the table because ultimately we are the global users of the internet. And most of these decisions done by, as you said, wealthy people are not enough to represent people's needs. And so I would say in my future of the internet, we have, you know, grassroots and public entities and underrepresented communities kind of pushing forward in this future of a decentralized web. Um, what are your thoughts on what you would hope the future of the internet would look like and what kind of direction are we moving into? Yeah, I, uh, I, okay, so listen, mm -hmm. I, I agree with the, that future, that vision. That is my vision. Now, you asked me what the future looks like. I, I heard once that if you want to predict the weather tomorrow, just predict it's going to be the same as today and you'll be right about 70% of the time. Mm -hmm. So, what's the future of the internet? I'm going to predict the future of the internet will be one of US hegemonic control. Mm -hmm. And I figure I'm going to be right in predicting that until I'm not. Okay. And it's the until I'm not that's interesting. What internet comes next and who experiences that internet first? Who is going to be the first group to experience that next experience of the internet? And there will be no singular experience of the internet that comes next, but there will be only probably one that's best, one that's good, right? Right now, unfortunately, that best internet is, is kind of maybe the one you experience in the West, knowing that there are some differences between the EU and the US internet. Unfortunately, this is about as good as it gets. When we develop one that's better, who's going to experience it first? Here's what I would like to see, okay? I would like to see underrepresented groups, maybe in the U.S. where I think it would be possible to do it, organizing to produce a local, okay, probably necessarily local, but democratically controlled network that interoperates with the internet that we have selectively to the extent that it wants to. And that internet can spread. And I think that that grassroots organizing can create many local inter internets that are democratic and interoperate with each other. And my question, when I think about that vision, which I think is a possible vision, if not a likely vision, can those new internets create new kinds of governance? Can we govern via an internet? Not via this internet, but is there some kind of internet that can serve as a platform for democratic governance, inclusive governance? And the answer to that question, I think, is yes. And you can expect to hear probably a lot more from me about that in the near future. That sounds good. And on your thoughts on a future internet, where does the metaverse come into play? That's a whole other issue to tackle that's coming you know, forward. I 
I I think that this observation has been made many times, but but the metaverse was uh, coined by Neil Stevenson in a 1990s cyberpunk book called uh, Snow Crash. And in that book, the United States federal government had fallen to the control of private corporations who had effectively split up uh, control of the U.S. into their little private fiefdoms. And, you know, instead of you would, you know, using U.S. dollars, you would pay for things with like pizza hut bucks right and the protagonist of that book is a person of color who lives in a you store it near lax uh because of you know rampant housing crisis and rampant inequality i think when mark zuckerberg read that book he thought facebook could be one of those companies that you know carves up the us and 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 and, and, and i think that in many ways that cyberpunk dystopia is kind of the world we have inherited so when I think about the metaverse as such, I can't disconnect it from that dark vision of uh, an ex- extractive United States stewarded by private corporations, but with the, you know, condoned by the government until the government's deference to those corporations gets the better of it. Mm. Has the government's deference to corporations gotten the better of it yet? I don't know. Maybe. We're on our way there, perhaps, right? Right. What is the countervailing vision to the metaverse that is inclusive? What is that anti-cyberpunk vision uh, for 10 years from now? I think it's much more what you and I are talking about. And in some sense, the more oxygen we give to imagining the metaverse, the less oxygen we give to hydrating this really great vision of what the internet could be, this anti-cyberpunk vision of an inclusive institution, of, you know, inclusive uh, uh, um, democratic, in, you know, processes, inclusive democratic governance um, that the internet, you know, I wouldn't say it facilitates it. It's only social practice that facilitates those things, but that serves as a vehicle for those uh, uh, social ideas and those institutions. I'd rather think about that. I, I like that positive note. Um, and to conclude, the Internet Law and Policy Foundry is a career development fellowship. So Nick, how can our listeners engage in the efforts to create a quote unquote stronger and more inclusive internet for the future? Yeah, check and see if you have a local mesh network in your area. New York has a great one, NYC Mesh. In the East Bay, we have People's Open. Um, You can also contribute to the Internet Archive. It's a great way to contribute to Internet stability and longevity. You can run a local mirror, and it's also a great place to meet people where you can get involved with kind of the sort of issues that you and I are talking about today. I'm a big believer in this type of local action. Uh, For these broader and more global issues, I would say sign up for my newsletter. Uh, it's nickmerrill.substack.com. It's the best way to keep abreast kind of of my thinking. And you can always respond to those newsletters. Those responses go straight to my inbox. Well, thank you so much. On, on that note, we conclude our fourth episode of the Tech Policy Grind podcast. Thank you so much, Nick Merrill from UC Berkeley Center for Long-Term Cybersecurity for joining us. And please be sure to check out all of Nick's work by visiting the Daylight Security Research Lab website and subscribing to his Substack. We will include both links in the show notes. Thank you so much, Nick, and have a wonderful rest of your day. Thanks, Lama. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Tech Policy Grind podcast. Be sure to check out the Internet Law and Policy Foundry on LinkedIn and Twitter. And if you enjoyed this episode, give us a five-star rating. It really helps out the show. The Tech Policy Grind podcast comes out every other Thursday. See you next time.